Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Christ Church. We're so glad to see y'all here this morning with us. Let's stand to our feet as we begin our worship service this morning. Uh, we believe here at Christ Church that God initiates our gatherings. God initiates our worship services. So I want to read to us a passage from the book of Isaiah uh, that lines up perfectly with, the, with this first song that just talks about the source of life and goodness that God is. So just listen as I read this for us this morning. Come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest affair. Seek the Lord while he may be found and call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the righteous and the unrighteous their thoughts and let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and to our God for he will freely pardon. We turn to the God who is the true source of life, who is the true source of riches, who is the true source of all that we need this morning. So let's turn our attention to him as we praise his name. Hey. 
service here at Christ Church called Same God. And before we sing this, I want to read from Psalm 102 here. In the beginning, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They all wear out like a garment, like clothing, you will change them, and they will be discarded. But you God. 
Lord, we proclaim your faithfulness to us. Even as there are some here today who would say it is difficult to say that. It's difficult to pray that prayer. And Lord, we know that even in the midst of challenges and loss and difficulties, we see your hand upholding us. Lord, we see on the cross that you have never let us go. You have always provided a way. You have always loved us. And so we say, Lord, you are so faithful. May we walk in faithfulness as we follow you. And we pray all this in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Fourth through eighth graders, you can head to your classes now. Fleet 45, heading downstairs. Six, seven, eight, heading upstairs. Good morning, everyone. My name is Siler Thomas. I'm on staff here at Christ Church. And if you are new with us today, if this is your first day here, we want to welcome you. We especially want, would love it if you would fill out one of these Connect cards. You can leave it in the pew. You can put it in one of the boxes in the back. Or ideally, you'd take it out to the Connect Center. We have a gift for you there. I can't tell you what it is, but it is a gift. So you'll have to just see what's in there. You never know. Uh, but we'd love to help you find more stuff about our church. You can grab some cold brew. There's some snacks over here. We want uh, this, your experience here. It can sometimes at a new church. It's not always easy to feel like it's home, but we hope uh, for everyone who comes to Christ Church that it will feel like home for you. So um, please get to know us if you would like to do that. A little bit later on, we're going to continue our series, How Do You Know? And Pastor Mike, this is week five of a six-week series, Pastor Mike is going to be talking specifically about why he himself trusts in the Bible. So we have that coming up, speaking out of Matthew chapter four. Uh, we are so grateful for the generosity of this church that makes so many ministries possible. One of those is our women's ministry. So as you leave today, you're going to get one of these brochures. Uh, telling you all of the ways that the, the newly relaunched women's ministry, there is so much going on. And we've got one of our staff members, Jill, Jill Carter, is going to be in the lobby if you have more questions about that. But just some highlights of some things, some upcoming groups. There's a wi Widows Leading In dinner on October 13th, a Working Women's Brunch on Saturday, October 15th, and a Holy Walkers group meeting Wednesday afternoon for a walk and a coffee chat. So if any of those sound interesting to you, we hope that you will uh, take advantage of these women's ministries. A few more things coming up in the life of the church we want you to know about. We have uh, membership classes that are coming up soon. If you would like to be uh, a member at Christ Church, we've got an in-person meeting a week from today here at this campus, and then we've got one over Zoom on Tuesday, October 18th. You can sign up on the website. We have institute classes that you've been hearing about for a while. Those start this week, and either of these would be such a great use of your time. Um, Dana Harris, who was here last week talking about New Testament survey, and uh, if you notice, there is, there's Monday, October 10th. That's actually, and then Tuesday, October 11th. This is a friend of mine, Taylor Worley, talking about spiritual formation through the arts. He was on staff at Trinity. Now he's on staff at Wheaton. Just a phenomenal guy. Everything he says is super, super interesting. So I hope that you will continue uh, coming to one of these classes this week. Those start up. Two more things for you. Next Sunday evening is our worship concert concert celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month here at 7 p.m. Hope you can enjoy, join us for that. And then we've got this trunk or treat extravagant. It's not any old trunk or treat, folks. No, no. It's an extravaganza. Why? Because we said it was. That's why. That's all we can tell you. Uh, and I'm just saying, the kids today, trunk or, trunk or treat? Like, in addition to what? It's just a, just, just a candy, you know, it's... It's a great time of year to be. It's a great time to be alive and be a child, I would say. Uh, so that's happening at Crossroads. We could use some help with candy donations. So if you can bring those in uh, sometime before Thursday, October 20th to support that. And we hope if you've got a family, you've got neighbors, that you will consider coming to this event. 
The last thing we're going to do today is I'm going to introduce you to someone who is our newest intern at this campus. We are close to Trinity Seminary. A number of us on staff went to Trinity, and I wanted to introduce you to Stephen. Stephen is uh, our newest intern. Stephen, tell us who you are and how to pronounce your last name. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Um, yeah, so my full name is Stephen DiDomizio. It's Italian. Hard to pronounce. No one gets it right on the first time. <laughs> if you're close, I'll tell you, like, that was very good. Yeah. But, yeah, I'm a student at TEDS, finishing on my MDiv, so I should finish this May, and then a week after graduation this May, I'm getting married, so that's also very exciting. And then after that, I'm heading to Wichita, Kansas. I accepted a two-year pastoral residency there. But I'm super excited to be interning at Lake Forest. I mean, Christchurch has just been so special to me and so many others that I love and hold dearly. So Yeah. And uh, he was at our Vernon Hills campus as an intern for the last ministry year. He's here now. He's actually been a, a volunteer in our high school ministry for the last four years. So we love Stephen, and we're just so excited. We're, we're really blessed to have Trinity nearby and to have these uh, folks coming in and then to send them out and to make an impact in the kingdom. So uh, Stephen's going to read our scripture for us today. Would you please stand for the reading of scripture? This is Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry, and the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against the stone. Jesus said, and again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdom of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering him. Amen. At this time, we are going to pass the peace with one another. If you've been around here, we've done this for a while here. An opportunity to share the peace of Christ that he has given us with those around us and say hello to someone around you. And then when you're done with that, you're welcome to just have a seat. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with Hey, how are you? Peace be with you. How are you? Always here, looking dapper in the front row. Great to Hi folks, Pat O'Malley here, joining you from beautiful Wrigley Field on game day. And uh, for this week, we decided we're going to ask some Cubs fans some Cubs trivia. So enjoy this Cubs trivia with these Cubs fans. Have some fun. Here we go. Go Cubbies. And which Cub led the league in ERA in 2016? Led the league. He also was the winning pitcher in the, in the NLCS when, the, when we went to the playoffs or with the World Series. Wow. 
Uh, it rhymes with Mile Mendrix. Hey, um, Kyle Hendricks. He got it. He got it. All right, Kyle Hendricks. All right. What was the name of the Cubs fan who was demonized for touching a foul ball in 2003? Trick question. His name must never be spoken. Which Cubs player led the league in the ERA in 2016? Uh, that would be. It's either John Lester or Kyle Hendricks. Uh, I'll go John Lester. Incorrect. It was, in fact, Kyle Hendricks. But you close. What does ERA stand for? Bonus question. Earn run average. Okay, this guy's a, he knows his deal. What year did the Cubs last win the World Series? This is a hard one. What was the name of the Cubs player to hit three home runs on opening day 1994? Here are your options. Buddy Boyd, Dizzy Dean, Rowdy Reinsdorf, or Tuffy Rhodes? Uh, what was the first one, Buddy? Buddy Boyd, it was not, it was Tuffy Rhodes. That's the only thing he did for the Cubs. We never heard from him again. Good morning and welcome, and welcome to those joining us uh, at home or at Crossroads, Highland Park, Vernon Hills. So. I feel like I should thank Pat, our uh, intrepid reporter, although he's not really staying on assignment, which was, you know, a little bit bigger questions than Cubs trivia, but oh, oh well. Uh, so this is week five of this six-week series in which we are asking how do we know what we know. We're, we're recognizing that we're living in a time of, of a lot of noise and confusion there's lots of voices coming at us. It's hard to tell who's telling the truth and who's misleading us. And the more confusing it gets, or the more we question some of the sources, the louder they get. They, they yell louder when, when we trust them less. And so it just gets crazier and crazier out there. But we're trying, we're focusing in this series mostly on the seventh of these seven questions. So we all have answers to these questions. They're guiding how we think and how we live. They shape our worldview. The first question is the God question. What matters most? What is of greatest importance? Who should I be focused on? Like, what is of, what or who is of the ultimate value? You have an answer to that question. It may not be the right answer, right? We have default assumptions that guide us. And so part of this is to sort of step back and look at these questions a little bit more consciously and a little bit more thoughtfully. The second question is, who am I? Where did I come from? Or who am I and how do I think about myself? Am I, am I a child of God? Am I just stardust? Am I, you know, the temporary pinnacle of the evolutionary process? Do I have value? Like, how do I think about myself? And then there are other questions. Where did I come from? What went wrong? Uh, what's expected of me? What happens when I die? The, the, the seventh question, again, which is sort of animating this series, is where do I look to get answers to the first six questions? <laughs> so how do I know what I know? What are the sources that ultimately I can and should trust? So we have been throwing lots of stuff at you. Uh, so in this series, in addition to small group material, uh, in addition to sermons, there have been daily devotions and podcasts and lake light lectures and a book that's rolling out a chapter a week, all trying to help you step back and ask the question, how do I know what I know? What do I trust? Today, although this series has been on the seventh question, we're going to spend a little bit of time, sort of a flyover on the fourth question, what went wrong. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 4. And we're looking at Matthew chapter 4 in order to ultimately uh, answer the question that I ask in the book, chapter 4, which you'll get today if you're following along. Why do I trust the Bible? Why do I choose to trust the Bible? So Matthew 4 uh, was the temptation of Christ. You just heard it read. And in addition to Matthew 4, we could read that in Mark chapter 1. We could read it in Luke chapter 4 as well. So it's an important moment in the Gospels, and, uh, and it's an important moment for the question of what went wrong, and again, it's, it, it tees up the, the primary reason I choose to trust the Bible. So 
Having said all that, uh, if you want to follow along, we're going to work our way through this passage, Matthew chapter 4. While you're going there, let me say that um, uh, there's a lot that has been written about, a lot that is said about evil. Uh, It's a big topic philosophically, theologically, practically, uh, increasingly politically. There's a whole lot of discussion about evil. And just to sort of help you uh, turn this question, what went wrong, into a little bit of a multiple choice question, so you got a, you know, a, better, a better chance of, I mean, it's, it, you're, you're either right or wrong as opposed to an essay question where you can restate the question six different ways and hope you'll get some points for just effort. Uh, but to try and break this down for you, I just want a high-level flyover of your options, simplified. So I'm grouping together what we call natural evil, which is Hurricane Ian, cancer, like those kinds of things. Uh, human evil, which is you know, murder and rape and, and uh, stealing and war. Uh, there's also what we call societal evil, so poverty and injustice and those kinds of things. All these things get lumped under the, the, the title of evil. And there's three basic responses to evil. So there's some that say it doesn't exist. They deny evil. We get some in this camp or sort of in the Eastern philosophies, so some Buddhism, Hinduism, whatever, and they would say that, uh, look, God is everywhere. God is in all. Everything's good. You just have to learn to rise above circumstances, live in the spiritual realm, whatever. So you got some people that deny evil that, go that direction. There's a lot of people who deny evil because they say in order for there to be evil, there has to be some objective standard. There has to be God. And if they say there is no God, then they say there is no evil. Like there can be efforts to define what is good. There are social constructs that say we're going to say this is good and this is bad. But they would say, no, no, there's no evil. If there's no good, if there's no God, there's no standard, you can't say something is wrong. There just is. This again, this was Nietzsche saying that, you know, once, once the world wakes up and gets beyond this halo Christian effect, they're going to realize the only thing that matters is power. So you've got those that deny that there's evil. Then you've got those that say there's evil, but it's not animated. It's not a force, it's just sort of a lack of understanding, or it's just the reality of a broken world. It's the second law of thermodynamics. Things just break down. And most people in this camp, they, will, they have a high view of humans. They have a high view of the, of, the, uh, of the human condition. And they say, and they think, and they believe, with a little bit more time and a little bit more education, we're going to fix things. Everything's going to be okay. Like with a little bit more technology, pretty soon we're going to share. Everybody will have everything that they need. There will be no anger. There will be no war because we're good people. We just got to fix this broken world. Uh, I was reading, I was actually listening to a podcast this week, and and it went in an unexpected direction, and they said that part of the reason that the Allied forces did not wake up to the horrors of the Holocaust earlier is because a lot of people simply couldn't believe people could be that bad. (laughs) So FDR among them could not believe that there could be people that were being this evil. For him, evil didn't exist. And so he he had a hard time reconciling that. And apparently, towards the end of his life, uh, FDR was reading uh, Kierkegaard, who's a, a Danish philosopher, theologian, existentialist, uh, with Christian overtones, and, and uh, he was starting to understand this idea of sin and human depravity and sort of uh, waking up to this idea that, oh, there's actually a force of evil. And that, that comes to the third camp. So some deny evil, some say there's evil, but it's really just sort of a lack of education in a broken world. And then there's those who say, there are evil beings Right there, evil exists, and uh, some, the dualists, 
So there's a lot of dualists that say that there's good and evil, a God of good and a God of darkness, and they're sort of locked in an eternal struggle. Uh, and then there's what we'll say is more of a, a Jewish or Christian understanding of evil, and that is that, yes, there, there, there is an evil being, there are evil beings, but they're not God's equal but opposite. They're limited, but there is evil. There is personified evil. And in that camp, I mean, every camp has got five different subcamps, but in, generally in that camp, you've got what we're going to see, I would argue, what we're going to read about in Matthew chapter 4, people who are sort of taking their understanding of the reality of evil and the complexity of evil and the subtlety of evil and all of that from Scripture. And then you have a lot of, of Christians who would really have their theology of evil shaped more by the Friday the 13th franchise, and it gets all pretty bizarre and, and uh, weird. So uh, we're in Matthew chapter 4. I'm going to read this slowly. Uh, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So I've been in this wilderness several times, and I tell you, uh, it's hot. It's miserable. A couple hours in that wilderness, and you're looking for the air-conditioned bus to get out of the wilderness. So um, I, I share that to start by saying that this wilderness, this Judean wilderness, was a place where historically the prophets, the Old Testament prophets would go. John the Baptist had been there. Uh, Jesus would go there. They go there uh, not for the kind of escape that we often think about with the wilderness. I'm going to go to the national park, and I'm going to, dis, you know, dis, there's no cell phone coverage there, and it'll be a time of, you know, relaxing and clearing my head, and it'll be peaceful, and I'm going to be rejuvenated, and I'm going to be with God and nature. It's all going to be wonderful. So that's what a lot of people think of when they think of the forest, the wilderness, you know, these Edenic kind of settings. It's not at all what is being described here. So the wilderness to the Jews was an untamed, dark, unsafe place. And the prophets would go there to uh, sort of get in shape. <laughs> they would wrestle with darkness. And often, wrestling with their own heart. So this is what the church fathers ended up saying. So uh, you, you know, fast forward 300 years, for, for the first 300 years of the church, those people who really wanted, uh, those people who really wanted to be serious about their faith, they wanted to they'd find another gear, they wanted to suffer. There's some people that, you know, they're not happy unless they're suffering. Well, Christianity was illegal. I mean, just raise your head and it'll get, it, it'll get shot off. You could be beaten, you could be, you know, lose your business, you could be killed, you could be fed to the lions, whatever. After Constantine shows up in the early 4th century, then uh, Christianity becomes legal. And what a lot of people said, what a lot of Christians complained about is, well, now anybody can join. Like the, the standards of what it meant to be a Christian just went way down. Anybody, you don't have to risk your life to be baptized and to, to sign up to follow Christ. Anybody can just say, yeah, I'm in, and it's all very easy and safe. And they didn't like the church. So this is the beginning of the church Reformation movement. So, I mean, the Protestants, we talk about the Reformation in the, in the 1500s, Martin Luther. The church is constantly <laughs> reforming. The church is constantly looking around and saying, yeah, we're not doing this like we should be doing it. Like, there's another gear. We could love God more. We could be more selfless. And so the early Reformation efforts were the monastic efforts. So I'm going to withdraw. I'm going to go out and be on my own in the desert. And the, the expectation was not I'm escaping from the world. It wasn't like I'm getting away from all the bad stuff. It's I'm going into the wilderness where I will have to wrestle with my own dark heart. <laughs> like there's no... There's no Netflix to watch. There's no Wordle to work on. There's no ESPN. Like, I'm going to be left alone to wrestle with my own pride, my own greed, my own lust, my own anger. And, and, and there's nobody out there that I can blame. Like, 
It's coming out of me, and I'm in this, this, this wilderness. So Jesus is led into the wilderness. Two words in this, in this verse need our attention. The first word in the Greek, uh, peripazio, it is sometimes translated as test, and it's sometimes translated as tempt. And, and uh, different versions of uh, different, different uh, versions of the Bible will use trial or test or temptation. And that's because uh, the word is, is not really clear, and it depends upon the intention of the one giving the test. Like you, you can put somebody through something, and you're, you're hoping to sort of raise them up, help them find another gear, get better, you know, succeed. Or you can put them through the exact same thing and you're hoping they're going to fail. And so you have, please note, the Spirit of God leading Jesus into the wilderness. Okay, so the Holy Spirit, Jesus is still wet from the baptism and he is led. The Father has just spoken to him. This is my son whom I love, with whom I am proud. And then the next thing that happens is that the Spirit of God leads Jesus into this trial, this dark, difficult spot, the final sort of testing ground for him to get ready and launch his ministry. And uh, so you have, uh, you have the Spirit of God obviously loving and caring for the Son of God as he leads him into this trial. <laughs> but you have, you have the devil there to tempt, and it's the same word, and one is trying to pull up, and one is trying to pull down. It's just worth noting, you can be led by the Spirit into a very difficult spot. So lots of people think, I love God, if I'm, if I'm in, if I raise my hand, then life will get easy. No, that's, that's just not in the book. That's not the way this goes, right? Wasn't easy for Jesus, wasn't easy for the apostles, hasn't been easy for the last 2,000 years. So I don't know why you think you've won the lottery, and if you do this, it's going to be easy for you. So here it is. The Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So the other word, by the way, I said this Greek word that could be translated either as test or trial. The other word is, is uh, diabolo, uh, which is devil. And lots of different terms in the Bible for personification of evil. So Satan, the evil one, uh, the tempter, uh, you've got the God of this age. One of them is Beelzebub, uh, which the literal translation is Lord of the Flies, uh, which is where Golden got the title for his book, Lord of the Flies, which is you know about the British schoolboys who everybody thought, having that second view of evil, everybody thought, okay, it's good, they're fine. No, and they completely turned on each other, right? Because there's, there's actual sin and depravity, and so that's where that goes. I, I learned this week, I didn't know this, but the, the actual literal translation of the Hebrew term Beelzebub from 2 Kings is not Lord of the Flies, it's Lord of the Flyers. And it was uh, the, this idea initially that, you know, Satan is a fallen angel, he has wings, and so he's the Lord of the Flyers, and somehow, at some point, that becomes Lord of the Flies. So after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus was hungry, uh, which I think is actually sort of a funny line, um, a little understated. I'm, I'm not sure it's designed to be funny. There are times when I think Jesus is trying to be funny, and, and if you're in on the joke, it's pretty funny. I'm not sure this is one of them, but... Uh, after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was, humped, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So this is a quote from Deuteronomy chapter 8. And what I want you to see here is something very important. The key word in this, if you, if you look at this, especially if you look at this in the Greek, is, is uh, gegraptite. It is written. So you're going to see this over and over. It is written. It is written. It is written. It is written. This is, is going to be Jesus' response and beyond that. So uh, Satan is saying, try this. And Jesus' response is, no, it is written. And then he quotes out of Deuteronomy chapter 8. 
And I think he's talking to himself. So later on, he's going to talk to Satan. But I think he, this is just, he's just saying, okay, no, that's, that's, that's bad. <laughs> I'm getting, that, that is an effort to knock me off my task. And he just reminds himself, no. And then he, he recites the truth of God's word. No, it is written. Um, and then verse five. So the devil uh, then comes to him a second time and uh, it says, then the devil uh, came to him a second uh, time to lead him to the holy city and he had him stand on the highest part of the temple. <clears throat> if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written. Don't miss this, right? Satan is, is crafty. He's like, oh, okay, so this is the strategy. It is written. Okay, it is written. So he then says, okay, you're saying you got to do this because it's written. It is written. And he's now going to quote from Psalm 91. So he says, it is written. Uh, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift up your uh, they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Verse seven, so Jesus answered him, it is also written, okay, gigraptai, this is the third time, so <laughs> he, Jesus says it the first time, Satan says it the second time, Jesus now says it a third time, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. That's another quote from Deuteronomy, this time Deuteronomy 6. Uh, and then verse 8, this is sort of round three. So the devil uh, comes to him, uh, takes him to a very high mountain uh, and showed him all the kingdoms of this world and their splendor. All this I will give to you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Now this is not a quote from the Bible, but it is a reference to a promise to a good thing, the kingdoms of the world coming under the lordship of Jesus Christ. This is something that is ultimately promised. We read about this in Philippians 2. Comes a day where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So he says, look, if you come, if, if you uh, bow down and worship me, I'm going to give you all this. And what Satan is promising, don't miss this, what Satan is promising, you'll get everything you're after without the cross. I, I will give you, I will give you what you're after. And uh, you don't have to go to the cross. Verse 10, Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan. So here he's talking to, to Satan, clearly not to himself. For it is written, there's our word, Gigrapti, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended to him. So, um, as noted, this is a, this, the temptation of Jesus is a pivotal moment in the Gospels, pivotal moment in Jesus' final preparation before Jesus is going to, he emerges from the, the desert and he will begin his public ministry, his teaching and preaching, and that's going to lead up uh, over the course of the next three years to all the stuff that unfolds in the Gospels, and then, of course, his crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. So this is a pivotal moment. It's in, it's in the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And, and uh, it would, it would, a number of things would jump off the page to the Jews reading this and thinking about this and to the early Christians reading this and thinking about this. So he's led out into the wilderness for 40 days to fast. So the number 40 instantly is going to take them. And they're going to go, oh, wow, Moses fasted for 40 days. Moses was the, the, was the one who gives us the law. And then uh, Elijah fasted for 40 days. And Elijah is the greatest of the prophets. And so here comes Jesus. He's fasting for 40 days. Uh, it would also remind them he's going out into the wilderness for 40 days. That's going to remind them that, that the Jews, the, the getting released from Captivity with, uh, in, the, in Egypt, they're going to spend 40 years in the wilderness. Jesus is replacing the, the nation of Israel in a sense. He's the new and better Israel. He is the, the new and better people of God, right? He's, he's ushering and all that. The, the whole setting of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Satan, this is going to take everybody back to Genesis chapter 3 where Adam had that same test and failed. And, and Paul will write about 
Jesus being the second Adam and where, where the first Adam in a garden with lots of support and everything going right, the first Adam fails, but Jesus is the, is the new and better Adam and he is going to be uh, victorious. And of course, this is just, in the context of the Gospels, this is just another sign that Jesus is altogether different. So Jesus is the one uh, whose birth has been celebrated by the angels. Jesus is the one who fulfills the genealogies. Jesus is the one uh, who everybody, Simeon and Anna and Mary and then John the Baptist have all recognized, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus is the one who fulfills the prophecies. Jesus is the one who lives the perfect life. Jesus is the one who goes toe-to-toe with evil and succeeds. So there's, there's all kinds of things that are happening in this passage that would get people's attention. There's also lots to reflect here as it relates to our thinking about evil. So uh, it's, it's worth noting, it's important to note, that uh, it's clear that, that Jesus understands that evil exists. Right? He's not denying, he's not in the first camp, he's not in the second camp. Right? He's recognizing there are evil forces that we are doing battle with. There are powers and principalities uh, of, of darkness that we have got to be alert to. It's worth reflecting on the, the sort of the, the complexity uh, and, and maybe we would even say the sophistication of evil. Right? The, the, the quick little adaptation that we see with Satan where he goes, I'm trying this, oh, that didn't work, but let me use your tactics against yourself. And uh, the, there's a lot there. Uh, we could note that, uh, that uh, evil has a, has a good marketing department. Remember, evil is always ultimately nothing better than broken good. Evil will always ultimately disappoint. It's gonna overpromise, but it's gonna be able to underdeliver. Evil is Evil is nothing more than broken good. It can never fulfill. It can never ultimately quench the hunger in our soul. And uh, so w- when you actually get to step back and see evil for what it is, it, it, it has no appeal. Um, Hannah Arndt wrote a book. Uh, she was a Jewish philosopher, and she wrote a book um, on her reflections on the Nuremberg Trials. So this is the, the Nazis on trial, wars, crimes against humanity, and uh, some, of the, some of the big Nazi uh, architects of the Holocaust are there. And so she's there as a Jewish philosopher in the courtroom, and she writes about the banality of evil. <laughs> and what she says is she's expecting when she meets these, these high-ranking Nazis, she's expecting to see cunning or, or, or viciousness or uh, sophistication or something. And she goes, they're second-rate bureaucrats. They're, they're, they're very dim-witted sort of dupes. They, they didn't understand the evil they were doing. And they're small-minded, very unimpressive people. And so she's like, she was just shocked by what evil turned out to be, so much less exciting than a lot of people think it's gonna be. And, and so evil is not ultimately exciting, it's not daring, it's not courageous, it's not interesting. It's, it, her word, it's banal, it's just, it's just blah. It's like you don't even, you're not even interested. A lot that we could, uh, we could unpack as it relates to evil. I wanna be sure you see here before we pivot, I want to be sure you see that all the things that Satan offers Jesus are good. Right? He doesn't try and tempt him with anything bad. The first time it's bread. Okay? So Jesus is the bread of life. <laughs> Jesus later on will multiply bread to feed the 5,000. Now he's saying, you haven't eaten for 40 days. Make some bread for yourself. Like, use your power to make some bread. And, and it's not that the offer is inherently bad. Right? It's just going to take him off task. Jesus never uses his power for his own advancement, right? 
He uses his ability to heal and to help and all those things to help other people, but never for himself. So it's a good thing, just a misdirected good thing, that he comes out of. Then he says, the kingdoms of this world will be yours. The kingdoms. You're supposed to be the king. We'll give you, I'll give you the kingdoms. Let's just cut to the chase. You can have it. Right? But again, it's the kingdoms without the cross. And Tim Keller, uh, in, a pa- in, in, a, in a sermon on this passage, says, Satan could care less about getting Jesus to break the Ten Commandments. Right? Uh, because he could care less about uh, knocking it down, this idea that Jesus is our example. Right? Lots of people think of Jesus as our example. He's, he's the perfect example. Satan's like, yeah, no, that's not, that's not what I'm worried about. Let people try and be good all they want. Right? It's Jesus going to the cross and dying a substitutionary death. It's the gospel. It's him paying the moral debt of humanity. That's what I got to stop. So he says, the kingdoms of this world without the cross, and then the, the last thing he offers him is safety. So all the things that, that Satan is offering here are good things. They're not evil things. And this is surprising. In the, the Temptation of Christ, or I think it's called The Last Temptation of Christ. I didn't see the movie, but I read enough about it to know. It's Martin Scorsese film 15 years ago. The Last Temptation of Christ in the Scorsese film is sleeping with Mary Magdalene. It's, it's adultery. It's lust. That's what he thinks is the temptation. And, and that's not it at all. That's not what Satan is using to try and, and mislead Jesus. It's good things. It's far more, in that sense, evil is far more subtle, far more insidious, far more complex and sophisticated than we may understand. So um, I share all that to say this passage to me is, is critical because it, it, is the, it is the culmination, it's the fifth big reason why I choose to trust the Bible. So if you get the book, if you download the book, chapter four, it's free today, it'll go online. First chapter was just sort of setting up the whole situation that we're in and trying to help us understand all the complexity about, you know, all these different voices and how do I know what I know and how am I going to trust and how do I have to think about this? Then the next uh, two chapters uh, are, were on the, basically the story that unfolds in the Bible, looking at the Bible as a, as a two-act play. So the first act is the Old Testament, the second act is the New Testament, sort of what's going on here. The Bible is not Aesop's fables, it's not a collection of morality tales. What's the big story? And then the fourth chapter that comes out today is why do I choose to trust the Bible? And in that, I, I lay out, so I'm just going to give you the big five reasons that I choose to trust the Bible, which may not be the reasons that you would choose to trust the Bible, but the reasons I choose to trust the Bible, number one is its historical accuracy. So there have been lots of attacks on the historicity of the Bible, that it's, you know, it's, it's myth, it's, it's bad history. Uh, and I say, look, it, it's really not. Uh, so uh, there are times when our historical, our archaeological work, our understanding of history has not lined up with the Bible, and people have said, look, the Bible, the Bible isn't true. The Bible talks about the Hittites and no such people existed. Well, okay, but then we discovered the archaeological digs of the Hittites. And, uh, and it's sort of a funny little thing because a lot of the people that were arguing this were coming out of Harvard. Uh, this is back in the 50s. They were saying there, there were no Hittites. The Bible is historically inaccurate. They now have two Hittite museums at Harvard with all the archaeological digs uh, that have been done with the Hittites. So, so... Again, the Bible never starts a long time ago in a faraway land. It starts, you know, in this place, this year, this happened. And the history of the Bible proves itself time and again. Second reason uh, that I choose to trust the Bible is because it's been written in blood. And uh, so I just, I, I step back and I, I note that, uh, that, for a long time, people were against the Bible. And they said, it's not, you can't trust it because it was written by people who uh, believed. 
right? They weren't, they weren't objective reporters. They weren't dispassionate reporters. Used to be, I don't even think it's true anymore, that we said we wanted our reporters to be objective. I think now we don't want our reporters to be objective. But it used to be we said we wanted reporters to be objective. And so, uh, so you've got this critique of the disciples because they are not objective. But what are we talking about? I mean, they lose their life. They're not objective, but it's not like they're in sales and they're going to get a lot of money out of this thing. Right? They write this and say, this is true. We are surprised and shocked, but it's true. It happened. And they will go to their death testifying to it. The third reason that, uh, that I uh, choose to trust the Bible is because it does predict the future. So a lot of people are all wrapped up in eschatology and the book of Revelation and all these things. They're all about prophecy and they're looking for a roadmap of what's going to happen. It's not really the purpose of prophecy in the Bible. The purpose of prophecy is much more to say, uh, look, I'm a prophet of God, and I'm going to tell you what's actually going to happen so that you'll know that everything else I'm telling you is from God. So I'm going to give you this, and you're going to see that this comes true, and then you'll know that everything else I'm telling you, you also should believe. That was the ultimate purpose of prophecy. And then the fourth reason I choose to believe it is for all the bibliographic evidence that it has. Basically, it, it just completely dominates the world. If you're not going to believe the, his, the, the Bible because, of the, because you think it lacks bibliographic support, you're not going to believe anything. You shouldn't honestly believe anything that we think about history. So those are the first four reasons. The fifth reason, the big reason I choose to trust the Bible is because Jesus trusts the Bible. So here we see uh, one example. Here we see uh, that Jesus is trusting the Bible. When he is in a crisis, he is quoting Scripture to himself and to fight the battle. We can go to other places. In Mark chapter 10, he's walking with the disciples. They're on their way to the Mount of Olives. And uh, he says to them, by the way, you're all going to leave me. And they go, what? What? We've been traipsing around this God-forsaken land for the last three years. Like, what do you expect of us? We're here. What do you mean we're going to leave you? And he goes, oh, you're all going to leave me because it is written. And then he quotes Zechariah 13.7. When they strike the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. I know you're going to leave me because it says so in the Bible. We see what he says about Scripture in, in the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. Don't think I've come to overturn the law and the prophets. I have not. I have come to fulfill them. Every period and comma uh, I am going to sustain. So for a variety of reasons, I choose to trust the Bible because Jesus chooses to trust the Bible. So uh, I think I've gone long, so I'm going to end. Uh, I, have, I have a lot more. Read the book. Uh, let me say this. You really do have a choice. Like, you, if you choose not, if you want to not trust the Bible because it makes demands on your life, you can find reasons not to trust the Bible. But you've got to understand what you will choose to trust has got a lot more problems than what you're trusting. And, and we're living in a world where, where what everybody is passionate about and believes today, they're changing it tomorrow. It is unstable, it is incoherent, and it is not ultimately helpful to you. It doesn't work. You have God's word. And, and we're, we, I think we're a little bit unprepared for the moment we're living in. All the voices, all the anger, all the chaos. I want to say to you, there is a roadmap of other things that really matter, and it's found in Scripture. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, help us to see things more clearly. Guide and direct us. Uh, give us clarity. Help us to sense your direction and your presence. We thank you and we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. As we conclude our service today, if uh, you have any sort of prayer need, we would love for you to come 
someone from our prayer team uh, and let them pray for you. We also have sort of a self-serve communion table here. If you would like to receive communion before you go, you can do that in a, a moment here uh, at the front. Uh, would you please stand for our benediction? Lord, as we go, there's so many things calling for our attention, saying, trust in me. May we trust in you and trust in your word as a light to the world. Amen. Go in peace.